Well, hey, I remember when I was a youth pastor, we did these annual mission trips to Mexico. And I remember the very first time we went down to Mexico and we got to the place where we were going to serve for the week. I found out, to my surprise, by the way, that because they had a limited water supply, I was only going to be able to take two showers during the week that we were there. Now, a little background info on me, if you didn't know this already. I love showers, and I need to take a shower every morning, okay, because I don't drink coffee. I'm not a coffee drinker, so shower is my coffee. It's how I get up. It's how I wake up. It's how I get going in the morning, and you know what I decided when we were in Mexico that first year? I said, you know what? If I can't take a shower every day, I will not take any showers at all the entire week we are here in Mexico. I know it's a little extreme, but I was a youth pastor, so can you blame me? I was Personally, I couldn't have it all, so I, I'm not going to, I was being a little extreme, but also I was a youth pastor, okay? I was being a little extreme, trying to show off for the students. And I'll tell you what, by the end of the week, I was dirty, I was disgusting, and when we got home and I took that first shower, it was the most refreshing shower I'd ever taken in my entire life. In fact, I think that when I took that shower, I lost five pounds, five pounds of just dirt that was falling off of my body. Now, the reason why I share that story is this is just like we all need physical cleansing, we all also need spiritual cleansing. You see, the Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And here's what sin does. Sin stains your soul. And so we all need cleansing. In fact, I'll just speak for myself in my own life. There have been many times in my life where I have sinned and I have felt the stain of sin on my soul and it felt like it could never be cleansed. It felt like, how could God ever love me? How could God ever forgive me? How could I ever be free? How could I ever have hope or be whole? And maybe some of you listening today, maybe you can relate to that. Maybe there's been a a time in your life because of something you did or because of something you said or maybe even something that somebody said or did to you. And so you felt like your soul had a stain and you're thinking, God, could, could I ever be cleansed? Could I ever be made whole again? And you see, that's the very question I want us to address and answer today. Today, I want to talk to you from the title of, and it's a question, is Jesus willing to cleanse me? Is Jesus willing to cleanse me? If you didn't know already, we're in a series titled Unfiltered Jesus. We're going verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark, which tells us about Jesus' life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection. In fact, I want you to just turn to our neighbor and say this. Say, unfiltered Jesus. Unfiltered Jesus. We're not filtering Jesus through these different lenses. No, we want to see him as he really is. We're going to let him speak for himself. And today we're going to let him answer this question. Is Jesus willing to cleanse me? And the reason we're answering that question today is because we're going to be in Mark chapter 1, verse 40 to 45. And in these verses, Jesus has an encounter with a man that is infected with leprosy. And this man asks Jesus, he says, Jesus, are you willing to heal me and cleanse me? And as we look at this interaction between this man and Jesus, and we look at Jesus' answer, it will show you Jesus' answer for your own life. So we're going to look at three truths in this passage that seek to address and answer this question. And I believe that as we look at these truths, as we look at the answer to this question, it could deeply transform your life. So let's get started. Number one, it's this. Is Jesus is willing and able. He's not just willing. He's willing and able. Mark chapter 1, verse 40 to 42. I'll read the first two verses to you in the story. It says, A man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. And moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. Instantly, the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. So this man with leprosy, he gets down on his knees before Jesus. He says, Jesus, if you're willing, will you heal me? Now, Leprosy is not a disease that is common in the United States today. I doubt any of us have known somebody personally that had leprosy. So leprosy, if you didn't know, it's a deadly disease, but it's a disease that 
kind of slowly develops and it, you kind of just slowly die. Your body basically slowly deteriorates. It's a terrible disease. Now, the Old Testament law actually addressed and talked about leprosy. And in the Old Testament law, leprosy was not just a deadly disease, but leprosy was also something that made you ceremonially unclean, which meant that if you touched somebody that was clean, you would make them unclean. And so the result of that is lepers were in a lot of ways cut off from the community. They were the outcasts of society. And the reason that was is because by being cut off from community, it was actually kind of protecting the community so that other people didn't get the disease that they had. And so lepers weren't in the in crowd. They weren't popular people. They were outcasts. And nonetheless, this man, he approaches Jesus. Now, here's what's so incredible about this scene is he approaches Jesus and Jesus doesn't say, oh, get away from me. I don't want to get what you have. Which would have been very common in that day. In fact, people with leprosy in Jesus day, they had to announce that they were even approaching people by saying unclean, unclean, unclean. He doesn't do that. Jesus isn't freaked out by this guy's presence. In fact, Jesus reaches out, touches him, heals him and says, I am willing. Now, it's interesting because if an unclean person touched a clean person, the clean person would become unclean. But the exact opposite happens here. Jesus touches the unclean person, and instead of Jesus becoming unclean, the unclean is made clean. And you see, in the same way, sin is a spiritual sickness that makes your soul unclean. But here's the good news is Jesus Christ is willing and able to make you clean. And some of you, that's hard to believe. You're like, well, you don't know what I've said. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what's been done to me. And some of you feel like well, there's no way that God would touch me in the middle of my sin, in the middle of my mess and make me clean. It, it, let me... <laughs> I feel like God would abandon me. Like, I'm just so ashamed. I feel so guilty. You know, Jamie and I, having our two young girls, Ariella and Noel, one of the joys of parenthood is you get to change a lot of diapers. It's really fun. And there are the not-so-unfortunately rare occurrences where the diaper doesn't do its full job. And so what happens is, is you have what's called a blowout, where just it's everything everywhere gets all over, the, uh, all over the clothes and everything. Now, there are times where that has happened, and it's like, okay, we can fix this, we can clean it, and we can put this item of clothing back in the normal rotation. Like, i got to be honest with you. There's been some times where it's like, abort the mission. This isn't worth it. This, it we're not going to clean it. We're just throwing this thing out. It's over. And some of you, you feel so dirty, you so, feel so messy, you feel like God's just going to throw me out. God doesn't want anything to do with me, but I want you to tell I want you to know this. The act exact opposite is true. God does not throw you out in the middle of your mess. He comes near to you, he touches you, and he cleanses you when you could never cleanse yourself. And the reason why that is, there's actually two reasons. You see, there's a reason why he's willing, and there's a reason why he's able. First, let's look at the reason why he's willing. He's willing because he's a God of compassion. Did you notice that the man says, Jesus, are you willing to heal me? Are you willing to cleanse me? And it says that Jesus Christ was moved with compassion. And then he touched the man and he healed him and the leprosy left him immediately. Here's the thing. God is a God of compassion. You see it all throughout scripture. In fact, I'll just read one other scripture to you. Psalm chapter 103, verse 8. It says this. It says, the Lord is what? Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. You see, because Jesus is compassionate, he will come to you in the middle of your mess and he will cleanse you. Now, what does it mean for Jesus to be compassionate? Well, here's what it means. This is what compassion is all about. Compassion means that God sees you in the middle of your pain and in the middle of your sin, and he's not numb to it. He's not cold to your uncleanliness. He's not cold to your pain. In fact, he sees you in the middle of your pain and he feels bad for you. He wants to help you. He pities you. He relates to you. He has compassion for you. In fact, the Bible says that Christ had so much compassion for you that he was willing to go to the cross for you. And what happened when Jesus Christ went to the cross? On the cross, he was made unclean. 
That's why when he was on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The reason the father had forsaken him in that moment is because he had become unclean. In that moment, he had become guilty of greed and in lying and lust and adultery and all the worst sins you could ever think of. In that moment, our sins were placed on his shoulders. He became unclean. He died the death that we deserved and he rose again so that if you place your faith in him, you could be made clean. He was willing to do that because he has compassion for you. And he had so much compassion for you, he was willing to go to the cross. You know, I have some friends that are police officers, others that are firefighters. I've had some friends that work in healthcare and in the ER. And one of the common things I've heard from people that work in those types of lines of work, if they said, you know, I just, I see so much death. I see so much trauma. I see so much pain. I can't even cope with it. So I've just learned to numb myself and not feel anything. And here's what's so incredible about the God of the universe is he doesn't just see a limited amount of pain and suffering and sin. He sees all of it. God knows every sin you've ever committed. God knows all the pain that you have gone through and will go through. He sees everybody's stuff. He reads everybody's mail. He knows everything about every single one, yet he does not numb himself to it. He's compassionate. And his compassion moves him to cleanse us. But he's not just willing, he's able. Now, why is he able? I'll tell you why Jesus Christ is able to cleanse you. He's able because he is God. Jesus Christ was not just a teacher. He was not just a prophet. He was just not an ordinary person. Jesus Christ was fully God and fully human. He was God leaving heaven and coming to earth on a rescue mission to save you. And I love this story between Jesus and the leper because it says Jesus touched the leper and the leper was cleansed when? few hours later immediately why because he's the god of the universe the same god that spoke the world into existence at any time can say anything and it will be so and here's the thing right if if god was willing but he wasn't able he wouldn't really be god if he was willing sure he'd be compassionate he'd be kind oh that's attractive but if he's not able he's powerless if he's not able he's not worthy of my worship But then on the other hand, if he's able, but he's not willing, well, then he's a powerful God, but he's a tyrant. He's uncaring. And this is what's so unique about the gospel. This is what's so unique about the God of the Bible, of Christianity, is he's not just a powerful God and he's not just a kind God. He is kind and he is all powerful. He is glorious and he's also tender. He's so high above us, we can't even comprehend him. But then at the same time, he stoops down to meet us to see us in our pain, to see us in our sin, to reach us, to love us, to cleanse us, to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. He is willing because he's compassionate. He's able because he is God. So he is willing and able to cleanse you. But here's the thing. You cannot be cleansed without humble faith. Which brings me to the second point I want to make today. It's this, is that you have to have humble faith if Jesus is going to cleanse you. Mark chapter 1, verse 40, I'll just read this verse again. It says, a man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Now, I want you to notice two things. Notice the humility and notice the faith. First, notice the humility. This leper comes to Jesus on his knees, begging Jesus, Jesus, would you please heal me? Jesus, would you please cleanse me? He's putting himself before Jesus in a humble state. He's saying, Jesus, you're greater than me. You're mightier than me. I can't heal myself. I can't cleanse myself. Jesus, are you willing? But did you notice the faith? He doesn't say, Jesus, do you have the power to cleanse me? Do you have the ability to do it? He simply assumes that Jesus can do it. He says, Lord, are you willing? So this man's question was not, Jesus, can you heal me? His question was, Jesus, will you heal me? Jesus, I already know you could heal me. I already know you can cleanse me. But Lord, do you have the will to do it? You see, this man had an undeniable faith that Jesus was willing, that Jesus was able. And the only question was, Jesus, are are you willing? Are you willing to do it? And you see, this really shows us The two sides of salvation, the first side is this, is Jesus Christ is willing and able to save you and to cleanse you and to forgive you and adopt you into his family and fill you with the spirit. That's God's part. But here's the other part. You have to have a humble faith to receive the cleansing. 
You have to have a humble faith to receive the gift of salvation that he wants to freely bestow upon you. You see, because it's without humble faith, without it, you'll never be cleansed. Without it, you'll never become a child of God. Without it, there's never forgiveness of sins. There's God's part, but there's also your part. Now, what does humble faith look like? Well, it's actually expressed in two ways that we see in this passage. First, you have to admit, and second, you have to ask. Notice that this leper first had to admit his disease. Lord, I have leprosy. If you want to be cleansed from Christ, if you want to be forgiven of your sins, if you want to be given a new purpose in life, if you want to be given a new hope and a new future, you have to first come to the reality in grips with the disease of sin that has infected your soul. And you want to know what the problem is? Here it is. Many of us live in denial about the disease of sin in our lives. Can I just be honest about that? And what would happen, by the way, just think about this for a second. If you were diagnosed with cancer and you lived in denial about that diagnosis and you never got any treatment, what's going to happen? You're going to die. And it's the same with so many people in their spiritual lives here in this world. They're in denial about the disease of sin. They're in denial about their spiritual state, and the result is eternal death. It's separation from God here on earth and for eternity in hell. Don't live in denial about the disease of your sin. It's a serious disease. It's a terminal disease. But here's the good news. There's a cure, and the cure is found in Jesus Christ. Now, here's the thing. You have to admit not that you just have a disease, but you have to admit that you have a terminal disease. And here's what I've found in our world today. This is what's really common. Is it's very rare to meet a person that claims that they're perfect. You basically have to be a psychopath to say that. Right. I've never really met anybody that said, oh, yeah, I'm perfect. So most people, to a degree, think that there's something wrong with them a little bit. But here's the thing. We all think we have a cold when we really have cancer. Yeah, I'm not perfect. I mean, I know I make mistakes. I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm not like Jesus Christ. I'm not like th the best. Per but I'm like a, I'm a good person. Like, I try to do the best that I can. I recycle you know, I, you know, volunteer at the little animal shelter on the weekends, uh, you know, once a quarter. I, I, I'm a good person. I try my best. Listen, the Bible says that even your best works, they're like filthy rags compared to who God is. The diagnosis is not that you and I have a cold. It's that we have cancer and there is only one person that can heal us. There is only one person that can cleanse us, and it's Jesus Christ. And in order to get that cleansing, you have to have a humble faith. And the first part of a humble faith is this, is you have to admit that you have a disease. But here's the second part is this, is you don't just have to admit you have a disease. You have to ask Jesus to cleanse you. And isn't that exactly what this man does here? He admits his disease and he says, Lord, are you willing to heal me? Lord, are you willing to cleanse me? And you see, the reason why it's so important to not just admit but ask is because there are so many people in this world that admit, but they never ask. And here's what I mean by that. That's called religion. I admit that I have a problem, but instead of asking Jesus to fix it, I'm going to fix it. And you see, this is what makes Christianity different from all other religions. You see, Christianity says that you have a disease that only Jesus Christ can cure. But every other religion says this. You have a disease, but you need to heal yourself. Obey God, do this, do that, then maybe God will heal you, then maybe God will accept you, maybe then you'll be in God's family. But the good news of Christianity is that no, God does it for you, you cannot do it yourself. So don't just admit, you have to ask. Because here's the thing, if you admit but you don't ask and you just try it yourself, it will never work. It's like having this stain on a piece of clothing and you just scrub and you scrub and you scrub, but you can never get it out. You cannot scrub the stain of your sin out on your soul. You can't do it. It doesn't matter how hard you try. It doesn't matter how good you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. You can scrub every single day the rest of your life. You can't get it out. There's only one person that can, and you have to ask him to do it. And here's the good news. When you ask him to do it, this is what happens. I want to read it to you. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. This is one of our staple verses as a church. 
It says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Stop trying to scrub the stains of your sin out on your soul yourself. Instead, come to Christ. And here's the thing. When you come to Christ and you confess your sins, he will completely eradicate every single stain from your soul. You will be completely cleansed. Why? Because he is a faithful forgiver. Come on. Is anybody glad today that Jesus is a faithful forgiver? He doesn't just forgive us when he feels like it. He doesn't just forgive us when we're on our best behavior. He forgives us because he's a faithful forgiver. And if we just come to him, if we just ask, if we just knock on the door, he opens it wide. But we have to admit, we have to ask. So can you be cleansed? Of course you can. He is willing and he is able. All you have to do is admit and ask. Now here's the thing. Once you have been cleansed, there's a certain way that you should respond. Which brings me to the third and final point I want to make today. This is that obedience should follow cleansing. Obedience should follow cleansing. Mark chapter 1 I want to read verse 43 to 45 to conclude the story. It says, after the cleansing, then Jesus sent him on his way with a stern warning. Don't tell anyone about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. But, and it's a big but here, okay, But the man went and spread the word, proclaiming to everyone what had happened. As a result, large crowds soon surrounded Jesus, and he couldn't publicly enter a town anywhere. He had to stay out in the secluded places, but people from everywhere kept coming to him. So Jesus gave this man pretty clear instructions. Jesus, out of his grace and power, heals and cleanses this man, and he says that he gives him a stern warning. So Jesus was really clear. Jesus was really up front here. He said, listen, I want you to go to the priest, present yourself to him. It will be a public testimony that you've been cleansed, that you've been healed. But I want you to keep this on the down low. I want you to keep it quiet. Don't tell a bunch of people about it. What does this guy do? He literally does the exact opposite of what Jesus said. He's like, oh, I'm going to tell everybody about it. He's like, hey, did you hear about this Jesus guy? He healed me. He cleansed me of leprosy. It's amazing. And what's the result of it? Jesus' ministry is actually hurt and limited. We're told that Jesus can't even go into a town publicly, that he has to stay out in like the boondocks and like these secluded places and that people are having to come to him. You see, after Jesus cleanses you, he will ask you to be obedient to him. He will give you things to do and not to do. And your goal, what you should do, is follow him, obey him, trust him. And here's the thing. Oftentimes, what we do is we don't do what he says we should do because we think our way is better. But what we need to realize is that when Jesus is giving us guidance, it's not because he wants to limit us. It's because he wants to free us and protect us. Right. OK, I think about this from the standpoint of my daughters. Right. Ariella, she's three years old. She runs around everywhere. She's like a wild banshee sometimes. And when we're around roads, you know what I do? I hold her hand. Because she kind of gets the concept of not running into the street like she gets it like, hey, don't jump in front of a car because we've taught her that. But man, there are still some times where we're walking and she's like, oh, it's there. look, squirrel. And she wants to run into the street. And I'm like, no, you can't do that. Now, why do I give her that command as her father? Because I love her and I want to protect her and I want to preserve her life. And you see, that's all the commandments in Scripture. That's the Ten Commandments. That's any commandment in the New Testament. Every commandment in the Bible is not to limit you. It's to protect you because God loves you and he's your father. And you see, after God cleanses you, he directs you and guides you to obey his commandments because he wants what's best for you. Now, what happens here in the story? This man disobeys Jesus, and as a result, Jesus' ministry is limited or hurt temporarily. But what's interesting is, why did he do it? Why did he disobey the Lord right when, like, Jesus changed his life? Like, Jesus cleansed him, healed him, 
changed his life. Why would he disobey something that Jesus sternly warned him about? I'll tell you right now. It's actually really, really clear. It was the emotion of the moment, wasn't it? He had had this disease for who knows how long. He thought he was probably going to die in the near future, or if not in the near future, it was going to be this long, drawn-out struggle of pain. He was overjoyed. He was excited. And so he totally disregarded Jesus' command because of the emotion of the moment. Oh, I'm so excited. This is so incredible. i got to not listen to Jesus. I'm just going to tell everybody about it. And isn't it the same in our own life? We can get caught up in the emotion of a moment and as a result completely disregard what God told us to do or not do. I'm going to let that sit there for a second. Some of us, our biggest struggles in our life is because we're more obedient to the emotions in the moment than we are to the God that gave us laws and commandments that aren't based on the emotion of a moment, but they're based on his principles and his love and his grace and his truth that are actually what's best for us. Here's what spiritual maturity looks like. You want to know it? You stop trusting your feelings and you start living in faith in what God has told you to do. And oftentimes what we do is we do the exact opposite. We live in our feelings instead of our faith and who God is and what he's told us to do. Now, here's the thing about emotions. Can we just be honest? Emotions are really strong. But they're also very misleading. You know, I could be at Starbucks and, you know, order my wife a drink and the Starbucks barista might make her drink wrong. And in that moment, I could have the emotion of anger to want to yell at the barista. Hey, I said oat milk, not whole milk. What are you doing? You're wasting my time here. Come on, let's go. Like, the emotion of the moment can get you to do something that you know you shouldn't do. But what God is calling you to do is trust him instead of your feelings. In fact, this is what the Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 93. I love this verse. The psalmist writes, he says, I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have preserved my life. God's way is the best way. What God tells you to do and not do is not to limit you, it's to free you, it's to preserve your life. So obey him, trust him, and here's why you can trust him, by the way. You can trust his commands because the God that commands you is also the God that cleanses you. So if he was willing to die on the cross for your sins and cleanse you, don't you think the commands he gives you are for your good, not for your detriment? He's already proven to you that he loves you by cleansing you to trust his commands, obey his commands. And by the way, as we've been seeking to answer this question today, is Jesus willing to cleanse me? I hope by now the answer is really clear to you. I hope you see it. Yes, he's willing. He's able. So really the question that I want to pose as we begin to close together today is this. It's actually more personal directed at you. Yeah, okay, Jesus is willing and he's able to cleanse you. But question, have you been cleansed? Have you admitted your disease? Have you asked Jesus Christ to cleanse you? If you're here and you've never done that today, you can do that today for the very first time. Maybe you're here today and you've already placed your faith in Jesus. You've already been cleansed. Then I got a question for you. The question is this. Okay, you've been cleansed, but are you obeying his commands? Have you been cleansed but still living in filth? As a child of God that has been cleansed, live according to your identity, not according to the patterns of this world. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. Be transformed. Follow him. Trust him. But some of you today, you've never been cleansed by Christ. You've never admitted your disease. You've never truly asked Jesus to cleanse you. You've maybe even been to church. You've maybe even heard about the gospel. You've been around it before, and you've known about God, but you haven't yet personally known him. You haven't personally known the joy that comes from being cleansed. If that's you today, I want you to know this. The cleansing is a free gift that you can receive by faith. You know, just this last week, I got my car washed, and you know what? I had to pay for it. This morning... I had to take a shower at my house, and guess what? The water that came out, I'm going to have to eventually pay for it. But here's the good news that comes from Christ is he can cleanse you, and you don't got to pay for it. It's free. You don't achieve it. You receive it by faith. So no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how dirty or messy or how stained your soul is, no matter who you are, come to Christ by faith today. Admit what you've done. Ask him to cleanse you, and when you do that, you will be completely cleansed. The joy of the Lord will be your strength. And from that place, that is when you can be transformed and you can begin to obey him 
and not just be cleansed by Jesus, but start to live like him. Let's pray. And in this moment, I just want to pray a prayer of receiving cleansing from Christ. And in this moment today, if you've never done that before, I want to invite you to just pray this prayer in your heart with me. Or maybe you're a believer and there's just been something that's been nagging you. Something you feel like you need to be cleansed of. You need to just get off your chest. I just want to invite any of you, wherever you're at in your faith, just to join me in this prayer. You could pray something like this. Jesus, thank you for coming from heaven to earth to cleanse me. Thank you, Jesus, for going on the cross and becoming unclean for me and rising again. Lord Jesus, in this moment, I come to you and I admit to you that I've sinned. Lord, I, in this moment, also ask that you would cleanse me of my sin. And Lord, from this moment forward, Lord, help me to not just be content with you cleansing me, but Lord, help me to live a life that reflects the cleansing that you've freely given. I thank you for what you've done. It's in Christ's name.